Well, again, we are so glad that you're in church today. We are doing a series of Advent messages to prepare our hearts for Christmas, and we're going to continue that today. Well, some great historical events happen rather quietly. I think you know that. You could probably identify some in your own mind that you are familiar with and go, this was a historical event that I learned about that was so significant, but it went under the radar. People didn't know about it. As a matter of fact, some great historical events happen so quietly, they virtually go unnoticed at the time and even centuries later, right? For example, my birth. <laughs> unnoticed. Nobody cares. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let me give you a real good example. Thank you for laughing. Thank you. I don't know if you could hear that, but she liked that joke too. One great example of, yes, I know. There goes the binky. <laughs> the binky just went in. <laughs> One great example of this can be seen in the events that surrounded the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some of you were alive at this time in world history and you know the tensions that existed. But on October 27th, 1962, a group of 11 United States Navy destroyers located a diesel-powered nuclear-armed Soviet Foxtrot-class submarine. And despite being in international waters, the U.S. Navy started dropping depth charges. And these are explosives intended to force the submarine to come to the surface for identification. Go U.S. Navy. Amen? <laughs> we don't care for an in international waters. That was supposed to be funny, but a little levity there. We are pro-U.S. Navy, right, here? Yeah. Okay, good. I was a little worried. I was speaking to a Russian congregation here or something. <laughs> Since the submarine had lost all contact with Moscow for several days, those on board the submarine did not know whether war had broken out. They seriously thought war had broken out. It was protocol on a Russian submarine at this time that three senior officers had to agree to launch a nuclear missile. Two of the three senior officers on that submarine were in full agreement that a nuclear missile should be launched at the United States. But there was one officer who stood alone and stood up and said no. His name, Vasily Arkhipov. And unbeknownst to many, World War III was quietly averted, an event that is still not known to many Russians or U.S. citizens, all because this man stood up and said no. Some great historical events happen rather quietly, again, below the radar. And history is littered with these sort of examples. And I, like I said, each of us probably has one or two in our mind that, we, that, that fall into this category. But there is, without a doubt, one quiet historical event that, arise, that rises above all the others. And of course, it is the birth of the Son of God 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Jesus entered this world rather quietly. I mean, compared to the second coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ has to be described as quiet in nature. The second coming of Christ is going to be magnificent. The whole world is going to see it. From one end of the earth to the other, when Christ comes back, we will know that he has returned. But that wasn't the case with the first coming of Christ. The first coming of Christ was quiet. It's almost a whisper. <laughs> it's almost a whisper. It was a hardly a blip on anyone's radar. But isn't that just like God? Isn't that just like God? See, God, folks, has a history of working quietly. God has a history of working quietly. Yes, God sometimes works in ways that are magnificent for all to see. He parted the Red Sea. He provided manna. He fed 5,000 people. When God wants to show himself strong, he can do it. But oftentimes, God is working quietly. Very, very quietly. Sometimes he's working so quietly we forget he's even there. I bet, I bet that's true of all of us in this room. That there's been seasons of our lives where God has worked so quietly that we forget he's even working in our lives. There's an interesting story in the book of 1 Kings about a man by the name of Elijah. And this is what it says. And he said to Elijah, God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountain and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But listen what it says. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. 
But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And it goes on to say, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah learned something very important on this particular day. God often works in our lives, not with much pomp and circumstance, but quietly. Sometimes very, very quietly. God sometimes works so quietly in our lives that we attribute many of the events that happen to us as mere chance or random circumstances, right? Have you ever had something happen to you and you go, man, that was random? Or what are the chances? We, we, we just can't, we can't believe it. But every once in a while, something will happen to remind us that God is more in control of the events of our lives than we could ever have possibly imagined. We have all had it happen, where we are powerfully reminded that things aren't as random as we once thought they were. And it's at those times in our lives we step back and we marvel that maybe God is more in control of our lives and the circumstances surrounding our lives than we give him credit for. And believe it or not, many of us live with a very impersonal God. Many Christians live with a very impersonal God. Sometimes I do. For many people, God is watching over his creation. He's just not very involved in his creation. Sure, we will concede that God is orchestrating the big events in world history. But the smaller stuff, no. Not the stuff on the small level. And especially not the stuff in my life. We tend to forget, folks, that God is always at work in all circumstances, at all times, even in the smallest of details. And folks here, if you get nothing from my message, get this. If there is ever a time of year we are reminded how much God is actually at work in his creation, it is Christmas. Just look at the birth of Christ and how God orchestrated every single event leading up to and including the birth of Christ. And you get an amazing picture of just how much God is orchestrating events within his creation. Now listen very carefully. Not only did God orchestrate every single event surrounding Jesus' birth, he did the same with regard to yours as well. You may not believe it. You may not understand it, but it's true. More on that in a minute. So just how much was God orchestrating the events surrounding the birth of Christ? We could spend all day on this. I'm just gonna point out a few examples. Peter says this. Christ was foreknown What does it say? Before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. The orchestration of Christ's birth started before the world was even created. In other words, folks, God was orchestrating things before there were things to be orchestrated. (laughs) And God continued to orchestrate everything so that Christ would be born at just the right time under just the right circumstances. Galatians says this, but when the fullness of time had come, in other, in other words, when everything was just perfect, the way that God wanted it, what does it say? God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Folks, nothing was left to chance with, reg- with regard to the birth of Christ. Every last detail of this amazing historical event was orchestrated by God. Let me prove it even further. God foretold very specific details about the coming of his son hundreds of years before he was ever born. And then he orchestrated events to fulfill those prophecies. For example, God foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem 700 years before Jesus was ever born, right? The prophet Micah said this, but you, O Bethlehem, you are too little among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. Let me tell you right now, folks, it is no small matter to say that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That's pretty specific information. God must have had a lot of confidence in his ability to orchestrate world events to ensure that this prophecy would be fulfilled. And guess what? That's exactly what he does. He does. 
How much is God orchestrating things? So much that he could say 700 years before the time of Christ, he'll be born in this city. And he was. God not only foretold where Christ would be born, Bethlehem, he foretold who Christ would be born to. Isaiah, he was a contemporary of Micah, says this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Again, folks, that is pretty specific information. And in order to make that happen, God is going to have to orchestrate things on a very specific level. Again, (laughs) that is exactly what God does. Now, folks, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The Bible is full of one example after another of God orchestrating events on a level that we can scarcely comprehend. Let me give you one more. The Old Testament said that Elijah would come to prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. God, of course, orchestrated events so that a young child would be born to a couple, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and they were to name him John. And he would be great in the eyes of the Lord, and he would come. He would be born just before Christ, and he would come preparing the hearts of the people for Jesus. Folks, prophecy after prophecy is fulfilled from the Old Testament, all testifying that God is orchestrating things on a level that we cannot even fathom. Now here's the deal. It's not just Jesus' birth that we see orchestrated by God. We see God clearly orchestrating everyone's lives. What does David say about his life? David says this, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Listen to this, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God's the great orchestrator. David understood very clearly that God was the one who was orchestrating the events of his life from the womb to the tomb. Jeremiah the prophet says this. God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, there is nothing random about your life. There is, no, there is no randomness or chance involved in your life. You will remember that Joseph in the Old Testament, remember his story? Right. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob wrestles with God, is given the name Israel. Israel has 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons' name is Joseph. Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. He ends up down in Egypt. He ends up down in Egypt. And while he's there, he tells the Pharaoh to save grain, to store grain for seven years because there's gonna be seven good years followed by seven years of famine. It's exactly what happens. It's exactly what happens. And as a result of the famine, Joseph's brothers travel from the promised land down to Egypt. And there they encounter their brother who has risen to the right hand of Pharaoh. And they're afraid. (laughs) They're afraid. But then Joseph says the most amazing thing. He says this, guys, God's been orchestrating all of this. He's been orchestrating all of this. You've got nothing to worry about. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I I in the place of God? As for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God was orchestrating everything. Consider Pharaoh's life. He wasn't a godly man. The Bible says that God perfectly orchestrated the events of his life. Romans 9, 4, the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Why did Pharaoh rise to the level that he did? Because God wanted him there. He wanted him there so that he could display, God could display his power on and through Pharaoh. What did Paul, the Apostle Paul, say about himself? God set me apart before I was born. Now you might be sitting here and thinking, well, of course God orchestrated the life of Jesus and David and Jeremiah and Paul and even Pharaoh because these men had significant roles in the history of the world. But I'm just me. I'm nobody. 
I'm just your average Joe. But not only is God orchestrating the lives of these men, folks, he is orchestrating your life as well. Do you want to know how much God is orchestrating the events of your life? I'll let the scriptures speak for themselves. This is what it says, Paul says of the Christians in Ephesus. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Folks, if you are a Christian, this verse is referring to you. You are known by God before the creation of the world, and God is orchestrating your life so that you might daily be conformed to the image of his son. On a more practical level, you want to know how much God is orchestrating the events of your life? All of them. Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Folks, there is not an area of your life that God is meticulously governing, isn't meticulously governing governing and orchestrating. And as we look at the birth of Jesus Christ this Christmas, we marvel at how God orchestrated all the events surrounding his life. Hundreds of years before he came, God was orchestrating. Before the foundation of the world, God was orchestrating. And our minds are blown. Our minds are blown when we see that child in the manger and we go, wow, God brought it all together just right, just perfectly as we should. But what if I told you that God has done the exact same thing with regard to your life? God has been orchestrating events so that your birth would come about in this generation. That your life is no way, in no way, accidental, inconsequential, or the result of happenstance. You were put on this earth, and I was put on this per- earth at this point in world history and we were born into the circumstances that we were born into and you are going through what you are going through for such a time as this. God has put you here today for such a time as this. Perhaps you remember the story of Esther in the Old Testament. Remember the story of Esther? Remember, by the way, the Jews were down in Egypt and they were slaves for 400 years and the Bible says that God called his people up out of Egypt and they came up and they entered the promised land where they stayed for a while, but because of their disobedience, God sent them off into exile, Babylonian exile for 70 years and there they stayed. And while they were there, the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. So now the, the Israelites were under the care of the Persians there was a woman by the name of Esther. She was just an average woman, an average everyday woman. But God raised her up and she became queen of the Persian Empire. Now this is why this is important. Before Hitler, there was a man by the name of Haman. Haman was the first Hitler. You read about him in the book of Esther. He wanted to wipe out the Jews. He was a Persian man that wanted to wipe out every single Jew while they were up in exile. Now God had raised up Esther to be queen. And the king didn't even know that his wife, his queen, was Jewish. The Bible says that as this plot went down, a man by the name of Mordecai, who was a relative of Esther, came to Esther and challenged her to consider the fact that God had orchestrated all the events of her life so that she might rise to the position of queen in order to protect the Jews. This is what he says to her. For if you keep silent, Esther, at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from some other place, but you and your father's house will perish. Then he says this, and who knows? Of course, he's he's not, he's, he's stating fact here. And who knows whether you have not come to this kingdom, listen to this, for such a time as this. Mordecai hit the nail on the head and Esther knew it. There was nothing random about any of it. There was no chance involved. God was at work in Esther's life orchestrating events so that she would be queen and could save the Jews and that is exactly what she did. And here is the point, folks. As we enter this holiday season, let the birth of Christ be the ultimate reminder to you that God is orchestrating your life on a level that you cannot possibly comprehend. You were born into the family that you were born into. You had the mother and father that you were supposed to have. 
You were given the gifts that you have specifically by God. He's orchestrating the events of your life in every way. By the way, you want really, one last really amazing example of how God can orchestrate things? You will remember that after Jesus' birth, the wise men, or the magi, came to visit Jesus. Who were these wise men? Who were these magi? The Bible says this about them. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Here's who the Magi were. The Magi were a pagan priestly tribe who lived up near and around and in Babylon. Now, why is that important? Where did God send the Israelites for 70 years of exile? Babylon. And he did it about six centuries before the time of Christ. He sent the Jews off into exile in Babylon where they came into contact with a whole new group of people, lots of new people, but one of those people groups that they came into contact with were these magi, these pagan, peacefully people. They were astronomers, by the way. And there they interacted. And surely the Jews would have told these wise men about a day when God would send a savior to the world. And told them all about the coming king. Now here's the deal. As a result, this story would have been passed down from generation to generation among the Magi for six centuries. So the wise men who came bearing gifts for Jesus upon his birth would have growing up hearing stories about a coming king from their grandma and their grandpa and their parents. And then they would see this star. They saw the star and they go, this is the one. There, there's the star we've been waiting for. We've been told about this for the past six centuries. Let's take this king some gifts. Folks, that's how much God is orchestrating things. God was orchestrating the birth of Christ six centuries before his birth, and of all places, Babylon. And if he can do that for Christ, can he not do that for you? Listen, the gifts that those wise men brought Jesus, frankincense, myrrh, gold, would have been not only acts of worship, but they would have been resources for Jesus. Because what happens to Jesus after he's born? He and his parents flee down to Egypt. They flee down to Egypt because King Herod is going to have all the children, two and under, killed. And incidentally, that is why the scriptures say that God called his son up out of Egypt. God initially called the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they were an unfaithful Israel. They were an unfaithful people. So God called his own son up out of Egypt, and his son true, uh, proved to be faithful and true, the one that God could work through. And that is why you don't necessarily go to Israel for your salvation. You go to Christ, because he is the faithful one that was called up out of Egypt that did God's will. When Jesus fled down to Egypt, they needed money. They needed resources. This gold, frankincense of myrrh, and myrrh would have been tremendously helpful to them. And here's why this matters to you folks. If God is orchestrating Christ's life on that level, six centuries before he was even born, he sets in plan a series of events so that Christ would have gold, frankincense, and myrrh so that he could flee down to Egypt. If God can do that, what can he do for you? What isn't he doing for you? God is orchestrating our lives on a level that we folks cannot possibly comprehend. God has been orchestrating events in history past to prepare, to provide, and protect you today. Some of you in here are wondering, how is God going to meet my current needs? We all have needs in this room. How is God gonna meet my current set of needs? How is God gonna meet my needs that I know are gonna arise tomorrow and the next day? Folks, not, we don't even realize that God has set in motion perhaps hundreds of years ago events to meet your needs today. Does that blow your mind? It should. It should. Perhaps God has set in motion a series of events seven or 800 years ago in another country to meet your needs today. That should blow your mind. But this is exactly what we see God doing in the scriptures. 
God works quietly. But folks, God works. He's always working. There's no happenstance. There's no chance. There's nothing random about anything that is happening to you, anything that you are going through, any cross that you are bearing, any financial strain that you are suffering under. God is in control of all of it. Now, if that blows your mind, welcome to the club. Proverbs 20, 24 says this, man's steps are ordained by the Lord. How then can man understand his ways? If you've ever struggled with the issue that God is orchestrating all events according to his will and how that fits with your freedom and personal choices, welcome to the club. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. As one theologian put it, if you've ever struggled with this issue of God's sovereignty and your personal choices, I feel your pain. (laughs) But folks, don't let this mystery keep you from resting strongly and powerfully and courageously in what the scriptures say. God's in control. Amen? God is in control. And folks, God is in control not just when he gives to you. He's in control when he takes away. What does Job 1.20 say, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord who gives and he takes away. We love to follow a God that gives, And we will say, blessed be the name of the Lord when he gives, he's in control, he's provided this for me. But here's the point, folks. Blessed be the name of the Lord when he takes away. Because when God takes away from your life, whatever it is, he's the one that's taking it away. He's still in control, even then. Even if your entire life, as you know it, is falling apart around you, you have peace that God is still in control. You may have no idea what God is doing. You may have no idea what God is doing when it's going down. Again, if that's you, welcome to the club. So often stuff happens to me and I'm like, Lord, what is going on? It makes no sense to me. But you can have peace knowing that God is large and in charge. And folks, that is why it is so futile to worry. That is why it is so futile to worry. When we worry, we are worrying about things that God has already been preparing long before you and I were ever born, to meet. That's the God that you follow. That's the God that you follow. And if you need reminding that God is in control of your life and is orchestrating everything according to his will, you return to the manger. You return to the manger and you let your mind just rest in the fact that if God could do that for his son, he can do it for you and for me. So I close with this question. And the question is this, what are you worried about today for which God is not fully prepared? 